For the past 25 years, Diane has been consulting on various Aboriginal education initiatives, both nationally and internationally. Diane has worked to promote culturally based training strategies in both social work and education. She's written several articles and books and has lectured on the topic of ethnostress and Indigenous models of learning and teaching. Diane is an absolutely um, inspirational uh, teacher and I really hope that you enjoy her talk today. Thank you. Thank you, Candice. That was really nice. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm here as part of Fanshawe College's speaker series, and I give my thanks to Amanda Zavitz for my invitation to be here with you today. The speaker series is focusing on unnecessary illusions, uh, and so I'm here to address and to perhaps challenge your thinking in a way that um, is going to be grounded or embedded in the context of my people's culture and my way of viewing the world. So Indigenous people have a very unique view, uh, world view, and we have a different uh, belief system and ways of looking at the nature of the human being and how that human being acts and behaves in the world. So a lot of these, um, a lot of this presentation is based on that unique understanding of the human being and the way that we move through the world. But it's also going to draw in, um, which is very nice to know nowadays. Uh, there was a time when Aboriginal people would be able to speak about or practice their ceremonies and their traditions, and nobody really understood what the heck we were doing. And oftentimes when we were in powwows or social kinds of functions where people would come out, usually um, non-native people and, and a lot of Aboriginal people themselves who did not grow up with this culture and this worldview would not necessarily know about the things that I'm going to be talking about or teaching. And so there would be people coming up and really trying to grasp and understand from their, their view, from, you know, from their perspective, and looking at, well, why are these people doing the things that they're, that they're doing? Why do they believe what they believe? And oftentimes when you would engage practitioners of that culture and tradition, they were unable to answer your questions because for us it wasn't that it didn't work, it just always worked and we were quite puzzled as to why you would even want to know how or why these things worked. So my talk today is an attempt to show you how and why these things work. It's to ask you, is to consider for at least 45 minutes here that I'm at the podium, to consider another culture's worldview, to consider another way of looking at life and another way of looking at the nature of the human being, and another way of looking at our connection to the very planet, to the Mother Earth as we call it, that we are connected to, because we know now, and it's very clear, that the Earth is changing. So as the Earth changes, a lot of people are up in arms because there tends to be a lot of loss of life. There's lots of death when things change and, and, and the way that the earth is moving right now, uh, it's very unpredictable and it's going to be causing people great angst and fear because they do not know how to cope with what's going to happen and what has been happening and what will continue to happen because we are indeed in an age and a time of change and transformation. I think it's exciting and yes I will be I will be you know part of the witnessing of certain changes in my lifetime and you well, who are younger than me, many of you are younger than me, will witness even more. So this is what this presentation is designed to do. It's designed to take you into, and we'll look at this thing called, uh, hopefully you'll have an understanding better of an Aboriginal worldview that helps us to understand and explain the changes. So as the temperatures increase and as the polar ice caps melt, we'll see what brings, what the future brings to us. So it is indeed an emerging future. So. To begin, I want to just give you a little insight. I can't go into depth into any of this material because I don't have the time, but hopefully in the shortness of that we're together, I'll have given you enough to help you um, navigate through some of the material. We have in our whole tradition, we call ourselves, I'm Mohawk, and so the name that you saw at the beginning was the name of the healing center and learning, healing lodge and learning center that I operate in Six Nations of the Grand River. It's called Gatni Gonli Otsalat, means the fostering of the emergence of the good mind. So from my people's culture, we call ourselves Haudenosaunee people, that, and we have an oral tradition. 
And in our old tradition, we have these stories that, that talk to us and teach, teach us, young people and, and, and all ages alike, what it is that we can um, do as people, as human beings. So there is a story in our oral tradition called the story of Teradapo. It's the man with the hair of snakes, and you see him portrayed there on the screen. And they say that Teradapo lived at a time when he, and he also possessed a great deal of power, a great deal of what they call personal magic, and that he could command the winds, he could command the seas, he had impact on the environment. And so there were times they said that he would, because he was isolated and living in the hills of Onondaga, which is the present day Syracuse, New York, which is where my people originated from, they say that he would um, cast great um, misery and cause angst and death amongst the people. And they said he was a very angry and a very um, scary individual that lived there in the hills. So at this time that the story is being told, we understand that there was a peacemaker who came amongst our people. And the peacemaker was there to bring about peace amongst the warring Haudenosaunee people, the people who lived in those long houses. That's what Haudenosaunee means. And these people lived in what's present day New York State. So the, that long house extended from present day Niagara Falls all the way over to the Hudson River Valley in, in, in New York City. So that was the land of the Haudenosaunee people, and they were at war at the time that this story is being told. And there was great bloodshed, and there was lots of misery and, and dying and death and things. So there was a piece that was devised by this, this young boy who was born amongst the people on the north side of Lake Ontario, which is present day uh, Deseronto or Belleville area. And that peacemaker was born there, and they said he too was born with great power and potential and that he understood his purpose, that he came here to this earth with a purpose, as we all do. You all came here, you're not accidents. You chose to come here to, for a purpose. And he knew his purpose, it was clear, and his purpose was to bring about the great peace. So as he traveled across the waters to deliver the message of peace, he was very successful in having an, engaged and having a number of tribes come online and to embrace the great peace that was within them, but they had lost connection to it. And so the last stronghold, the last person holding out on the great peace was this man called Taridapo. And they said that they had to go as a delegation because the peacemaker said, I can't go alone, this man has too much power. And so they went as a delegation of chiefs and women, and there was one woman in particular who was part of that delegation who we call today by the name of Jagun Sase. And Jagun Sase was the woman who went first to engage this man. So the men were there, but the woman went first. And when the woman came up first to engage this man, he, they said he was very scary. He, his hair had snakes coming out and twisting. And he was angry, and his body was twisted into seven crooks. He was like a crippled and very deformed. But the woman went up and very kindly and gently placed her hands on his body. And when she placed her hands on his body, they said that something changed in him because he suddenly felt the touch, the love, the kindness of the mother that he did not have. So if you understood the whole story, you'd see that he was abandoned by his mother at a very young age, and he grew up living in the wilds with the animals taking care of him, and he had become like that. And so when he encountered the touch of a kindness and the love of, of, the, of the woman, Jigon Sase, she caused him to remember the love that he had known at the time that he was born from the mother who had abandoned him. And so they say that he was healed that he came, he was transformed, he was renewed by the presence of the peacemaker alone and the company of his delegation. Because together, then the men, after, after the woman helped him straighten out the crooks in his body. And they say that her work was energy work, something similar to alternative medicine today, like Reiki or massage therapy or Shiatsu or something like that. That's how you would like him, that kind of practice. And his body had become healed, and then the body had healed, his mind then could accept different thoughts. And so the chiefs talked to him, and they combed the snakes from his hair, and he was able to encounter the power of the good mind, and which was already within him. 
So all of you have a good mind that's inside of you, an intelligence, a consciousness that is awake and aware. It is not who, sometimes it is not who we think we are, but it is the I of the I am. So when I say that I am, Gajichawaks, who is the I in you that is conscious of how you're breathing? Who is the I in you that is able to watch your thoughts and to track your thoughts? So that your consciousness and awareness is that which is the intelligence that is intimately connected to everything within creation. This is our belief system. That is the consciousness of the good mind. Because in this worldview, nothing in the world, no matter what happens to you, is considered bad. It's all good. Because you will learn, even if you have to endure great pain. You will learn from that. You will learn from that suffering. So the good mind and the peace that comes from recognizing and accepting that peace that's deep inside of each of us. When you're in the body and in the good mind, it's quiet there. It's a sacred space. It's peaceful. But if you live your mind and the intellect and the ego, your intellect is running fast, fast, fast. And you can't keep up with your thoughts sometimes. It's running so quickly that you lay in your bed and you toss and you turn. You can't shut it off. That's not the good mind. That's a thinking mind. That's an ego or intellectual mind that is designed to make up stories. And it makes up kind of awful stories. It tells you what, it judges people, it's critical, it looks at other people from other cultures and it makes up stories. And then at its very worst, it'll tell stories about you and it makes up stories about you and tells you how bad you are and how awful your day is gonna be. That's the intellect, that's the thinking mind. So what we need to pay attention to in indigenous science and in the Haudenosaunee science of my people is that the good mind, if you take this world, the fostering, Gatnik Gwenliotsala, if you broke it down, Gat means that things are simply created in this way. They simply, it just simply is. The Nigona is the spiritual intelligence or essence of creation that we share with all living things. We call it the mind, that's the consciousness of creation. And the eel is the positive or desirable attributes thereof. And the sara is the state of being where this can be achieved. So when you put it all together, what you got is a natural and creative human being or being who shares a positive mind with all living things. So that means in my worldview, we're at one with all of life. There is no separation. We are whole. We are energetic beings. And a contemporary practice of this, this philosophy or this notion of wholeness includes the, the capacity for all beings to transform and renew your life. And when we can know how to do that, then we foster the emergence of that good mind, that connection to the very essence of who you are. This is both a theory and a practice in indigenous knowledge and indigenous education. And so, we, you know, like all things, we don't know if the practice comes first or the theory came first, but the two, they work together. If you are whole, which we believe you to be, there is nothing wrong with any of you, you're already whole. But if you don't know you're, you're whole and you think you're damaged, then you start to create a belief system that's based on that damage. And then you start to create beliefs, attitudes, values that then shape and create your reality. So we know that all the physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual aspects of ourselves are unified within a body-mind, and it's empowered or animated by a force, the I of the I am. So that force enlivens you, and its individual being is strongly connected to the health of your family, community, and earth. And this view of health and wellness is very different from Western culture and Western belief systems. That's why you know, it's important to understand other cultures and other belief systems. So we need to build a bridge, in my opinion, this is my opinion, between Western science that tends to focus on the diagnosis and treatment of disease and between indigenous science that tends to focus on the promotion of wellness that is based on a return to wholeness, nothing that's broken. So what we have, oh, that chart jumped out of the way, didn't it? So what we have now is we have Newtonian science on the one side, quantum science in the center, and we have indigenous science at the third chart. So it's kind of difficult to read it. It jumped out of shape here. But you can see under Newtonian science, that's where we currently exist. So all of the belief system running our, our, our systems of medicine, our health, our education practices, our work environments, everything that comes comes from a belief system rooted in the ideas of Newton. 
And it's not that Newton was wrong. I'm not saying this is, this is good, bad, right, or wrong. I'm saying that Newton's science was incomplete. He didn't have all the information. And what we know now is through the quantum, through the research and discoveries of quantum science, we now can focus on things that Newton in his mechanical universe says it's all about the matter. It's all about what I can touch and feel and see. And that's what's real. But in quantum science, we now know that it's energy. It's the stuff you can't see that is equally real. So right now, your banking information is flying over my head. Your emails, your photos, your, your uh, videos, everything's moving through. And you turn on your device, and it starts to download into the device. So that energy, you can't see it, but it's there. It's like radio wave, microwave, you know, theta wave, beta wave, x-ray. They're all out there. You can't see them, but they're there. So quantum science finally gave us the language and a capacity to understand because quantum science was picked up very quickly and used by informational technology people. But we are very slow to apply it to the nature of the human being, energy. Energy, pure and simple. So quantum science is holistic. It sees the body as a quantum biological processor. Your body is a device, just like your cell phone, just like your computer. Your body is able to connect and pick up from the field of infinite potential and information all kinds of energy. And you're able to process that, and the body is able to present that information to the conscious mind for choice. So if we can understand the body is a quantum biological processor, and if we can understand that we are an autopoietic system, autopoiesis means we're self-contained. One cell out of the 70 trillion cells in your body is capable of doing what all those 70 trillion cells can do together. So one cell is actually able to digest, metabolize information, kick out waste, and it can utilize that energy, and it can divide. So you get a new stomach lining every two weeks or so, and that every atom in your body will repl replace itself and interchange in seven years. That's alive. That's organic. And you have a device. So you have the device called the body, but you're not your body. You are the animating consciousness, the life force that is animating this body. And when you're done animating this body, you will spiral back out into the field of potential and information and energy, and you will leave a body bag behind. And that's what we're going to bury. You got it? So you're the energy force that is animating, right? You're animating that body. That's who you are. You're not your body. You're not your story. You're not your history. Although you have a story, you lived a history, you're not that. Therefore, you are not broken because you can't kill energy. If I could kill energy and I could guarantee that you're not going to spiral out anywhere or somehow contain that spirit of yours so that when you spiral out you, of that body, I could use that. That might be maybe where next the science is taking us. And so indigenous science is one more step removed than the quantum science. So if you have a hard time with understanding what I just said about quantum science and quantum biological devices called bodies, you're going to have a heck of a time trying to understand indigenous people because we are one more step removed in our science and understanding of the nature of the human being than the quantum world is. And so I'm really happy because now the quantum world has at least given me a vocabulary and a set of science and research and things that I can draw upon because now I can talk about it, things that you can't see, right? The energy systems that you can't see. So we're going to need a bridge. And the quantum bridge between the two world, three, well, there's three worldviews here. One is Newtonian science, of which our current medical system and education system and everything is based on. There's the quantum science that's in the center. It's based on energy medicine and indigenous science that is medicine based on wholeness. So we're going to need, wow, we didn't check for all this, showing all of this up. You can follow this though, right? Because you're all intelligent beings and you're conscious. So why is the bridge important? <laughs> the bridge is important because this is what's happening now, right? If you got, so we got to understand that there are things that are shifting and, sh and we shift. Your body is an organic biological device. It changes every day. It, it'll age, it'll do all kinds of things. It never stays the same. The earth is the same way. 
the earth doesn't stay the same, although it, there's an illusion, here's the necessary illusion, that the earth is solid and that the earth doesn't move. And science says it does move. And science will say, ah, oh, there's tectonic plates and there's continental shifts and there's all this stuff and, you know, this, and it ebbs and flows and it sits on this molten lava and, you know, that's how they explain it. And my people wouldn't say it like that. They'd just say, well, you know, the, the North America is on the back of a giant turtle. And when that turtle stretches and breathes and moves, when that turtle stretches, then you get a shift, you get an earthquake, you get a movement in the land. That's how my people would say it. But no matter how you say it, whether you say it in the language of science or you say it in the language of a cultural metaphor, you're still talking about changes and shifting, and this is what's happening right now. So this is March 11, 2011. You see this young girl sitting there? She survives the earthquake in Sendai, Japan. So people look at this little girl and she's, they say, oh, poor little girl, right? Well, maybe not. Maybe she chose to live. Maybe that's why everybody dies around her and she lives because she makes a choice because she's conscious and aware. And some people will say, look at that picture and say, oh, she's probably saying, why me? Why did I live and everybody else died? Well, possibly she could be saying that. That's a good story the intellect makes up. We don't know. Or we could, she could be saying, I curse God. I'm cursing God. Why did God do this? Why, you know, why did God send down this terrible thing to, you know, kill people and take people away. And that could be something else that she believes in. I don't know. It's up to you and your perspective, your perception, and how you believe in what the stuff is that you, you grew up with and how you perceive this. But I will say to you how I perceive this picture as I perceive her is, yeah, she's upset because she's, she's alive and the rest is, and the life she knew is no longer there. That's why I think she's upset, because the life she had has suddenly, dramatically changed. It's not the same life. But I also believe that she might be sad because she's, you know, alone and she doesn't have anybody, but I certainly do not believe that God did this. This has nothing to do with God. It has everything to do with who we are as people, human beings, intimately connected to the planet and to the energy systems on this planet. This is a powerful force. The earthquake going off in the ocean sends a tsunami in, and a tsunami comes in and lifts boats and puts them two, on top of two-story buildings. That's power. And so that kind of power that we have to understand that we're messing with stuff that we don't really understand, and that if we live in a, an illusion that we can control the earth or, you know, do with the earth whatever we want, the Earth is a living and alive and organic. It will do what it needs to do to survive. They say it's like 65 million years old. How long are you going to live? So the Earth is older than human race. The Earth is older than the human race as we know it. So we are can be expended at any time like fleas on a dog's back. All the Earth has to do is shake and that's the end of the rest of us. So. This is a gas exploration company, Lapindo Brantes. It's, this is East Java, Indonesia. Look at the date on this, May 28, 2006. Those guys sent a probe down. They hit a strata of molten toxic mud, volcanic mud. It shoots up and they go, whoops. <laughs> they can't stop this thing. They just bring in heavy equipment. They try to build a crater around it to contain it. They can't stop it. They can't contain it. And it's still spewing molten volcanic mud. And this is what? Six years later. And look at the homes. The people in the homes are going under a sea of mud. So you ask the people, and they'll say, we didn't do that. The volcano, there was an earthquake, and it broke our probe. Well, yeah. But you guys got to think that when you're sending probes down there, they're trying to say, we're not responsible. The earth did it. We don't have to pay for any damages or be liable for anything. Those arguments, eh? That's the intellect, the story the intellect makes up. So our ancestors in the indigenous world say, you're being watched. All of us is being watched. Look at the faces of the earth that are watching you. 
So all these people get off this bus and they go running because we're told we're going to see the visit the ancestors and see the faces of the earth. And all these people run by me. And these are native people, by the way. They are non-native people. And they're saying, where are the faces? Where are the faces? They can't see them. Can you see the faces in this slide? Are you awake and conscious to see the faces that are looking back at you? It wasn't until the people got up to the tour guide and the tour, they says, where's the faces? And the tour guide said, look up. And then they saw this one. But they ran by this guy. They missed all of these guys. You see those, those faces? Or do you just see rock? Maybe you see this one better. This is in, this is Quechua Indian Territory in Ecuador which I had the pleasure and privilege of visiting, so that's why I took this photograph. But maybe it's this one that you see. Because people aren't awake, people aren't conscious, people can't see. Because your perceptual filters are designed, you're programmed to see only certain things based on your education, based on what your exposure has been. But when we show the Google map shot of the satellite, and when Blackfoot and Cree people are saying, you shouldn't be digging those oil wells into our ancestors. And the gas company, oil company says, what ancestors? So then you show them a shot of this mountain range and you see the Indian and then they laugh. The oil company says, look at the Indian wearing the earbud. You see, they make fun because they don't believe it. And our people will say, man, you guys got to wake up. Because there's the sun, NASA's high resolution photographs of the sun. You see the flares coming off of that? Here's a close up if you didn't see the first one. It was this photo that actually caught my attention of NASA's high resolution. Because I said, Jesus, I've seen this somewhere before. And I went through my PowerPoints that my friends, you know, you get all these forwards, your friends send you all these PowerPoints, so I'm no, I get the same thing. So I went through and I looked through my PowerPoints and I went, oh yeah, it was in this, this picture of this leaf. And they did this, they took electron microscope and they went in and they looked at the cells of a leaf. That nucleus of a leaf cell looks exactly like our sun. Look at the flares coming off. They call those thread-like cell receptors or gl ganglia on the cell. And they're coming off the nucleus of the cell. Doesn't that look like the sun? There's some flares. There's the flare. Look at the flare in the nucleus of the cell of the leaf. We could be looking at the same thing. So let's go look a little further. We'll go down into the chromosomes, the nucleus of the cell. And you go down further into the DNA chain inside the chromosome. And you go down further, and all you see is space. So what's inside of you, you all are just space. You're taking up space. And there's a bunch of electrons that are orbiting around at one picometer that looks an awful lot like our solar system when you look outside. And there's more space. And there's light, cascading light through space. One light year, that's our sun. So don't you think our outer space looks amazingly like our inner space? And you see ribbons and bands of light. There's the sun, the outer space, one light year away, and there's you. <laughs> That's at the very essence, because you're made from the same building blocks as that leaf is. We all are. The same stuff of the earth. So Hawking said, we are what we are, in his theoretical physics and his mathematics and quantum theory, he says what we are are wave particles or particles of light and waves of light. He agrees with the Eastern philosophers who said that we are energy beings and we are full of light. So here's a depiction of Alex Gray's work on the human energy system as we are connected and who we really are is this. This is what Hawking says is our wave particle, cascading waves of light. That means this can shift and transform. That means if this shifts and transforms, you can have the spontaneous remission of cancer just like that. Because nothing is solid in you. 
Nothing has to remain the same unless you believe it. And if you believe there's no change, then so it shall be. If you believe that there's a cure for what's ailing you, you are correct. If you believe that it's, incur it's incur uh, curable, then you are also correct. It's all managed by belief systems. So outer space resembles our inner space. And we get more and more light, whether we're looking out at the universe in the Milky Way or whether you're looking inside of yourself. But let's take a closer look inside that red box. And what you see inside that red box is color. It's a proton, we'll go in further. And what you see is a quark. Quark has color. Look at red, blue, green, you see it? That's what's in a quark. That's why they took it. There's smaller things now called neutrinos. Go faster than the speed of light. So what you have now is a human being with all the colors. So, we sh so there's the energy colors. Oh my God, we happen to have red, yellow, blue, and light. Same thing as a proton. So that's the human being. So Eastern philosophies were very correct, I think. They were onto something there. So in Ottawa, what we have is a Well Systems Institute, and they use cutting edge principles and concepts from quantum science and cellular biology. And they look at the power and potential of who we are as human beings. Already whole energy systems can't kill energy, remember? Energy just changes and transforms. So the structure of your reality right now might be very small, might be like the sliver of this pie. And most people are running around the earth being comfortable with the things they know they know and the things they know they don't know. But I'm telling you, the earth is changing and that's an energy system too. And it's shifting. And suddenly we're going to be thrust into things we don't even know we don't know. And to me, that's, uh, that's exciting. That's creativity. That's innovation. That's empowerment and change. But only if you believe that you're a powerful human being. Energy, capable of shifting, transforming, and having an impact on your world. You have to believe that in order to live in this reality. So when they found this creature in the nursing station at Big Trout Lake, and two nurses came across this. This animal, nobody knows what it is, science still can't name him. So they asked the Oji Cree people in the area, what is this? And they called him Omaji Na Okuz. What's it mean? It means he's ugly. <laughs> it was no big deal. He was just a creature that showed himself because there exists in creation all kinds of creatures. We're just only one form called humans. And they don't tell you of all the species of animals that are going extinct. They don't tell you of all the new ones that are coming. They don't tell you of the, the new species that are occurring. So just as we are losing polar bears, you're going to get something else. You see how it means? Because it's alive. It's an organic system. So you have a choice. You can sit back and be afraid when something like this comes down your neighborhood as it did in Tuscaloosa, Alabama last year in April, and Easter weekend. 269 people died in one town. They take pictures of this, people do this. And they see it coming, then they run. <laughs> then it goes over and you see the cars, look at how small the cars are, look at how big that is. They get after F5 scale, super tornado. And earthquakes in Haiti, they're getting bigger. They're becoming more pronounced. And there are many ways to choose the world, so how are you going to choose to live? What's your perspective on who we are and what we're doing here on this planet? So this guy believes in tension affects water molecules, right? So he's showing the tsunami as an example of resonance and vibration occurring at the level of the environment. Because we know you can't see resonance and vibration, but you can feel it. But if you're not awake to this and you're not conscious of what's going on in the world and the earth around you, you could be standing like this guy looking up there at the tsunami crashing and saying, what's that? And you'll be gone, so. But that's your choice, right? So you can send intention out there because you can't see a thought, but a thought vibrates and a thought has resonance and vibration. So you send a thought out, and you can say thank you, and it doesn't matter what language, and you'll get a water crystal forming like the beautiful snowflake. Or I can say, te voy a matar in, in Espanol, and you'll be saying, I want to kill you, <laughs> and you'll get the other one. 
So that's why we got to be nice to each other. Because if we are able to heal, we're able to transform. There's polluted water on one side. They did prayers of thanksgiving and, and love, and it healed the water. They tried it with food. They said, I love you on one and I hate you on the other. And rice was just as fresh after a week with the I love you as opposed to that. So you better be thinking nice thoughts when you're cooking for your family. Because <laughs> otherwise, this is what you're feeding them. So no wonder your family, you know, depends on where you come from, right? So everything in the creation, including us, because we're, what, 85, 90% water? Who knows? Responds to love and gratitude. So angry water can be healed, so can angry people. And that's what the story of the man with the hits of snakes told us, told my people. That's why we have it in our oral tradition. Our bodies are 85% water. We can heal ourselves. We can change and transform. And we have to be able to be comfortable with going into the spaces of the things we don't know we don't know. So here's some pictures, very quickly, of things that you don't know. Native people in Fiji walk on hot coals. Why they do that? I don't know. I'm not Fijian. I just know they do it. And I know that Fijians know something that I don't know. They know something that I don't even know I don't know. You get it? That's it. So these guys walk on hot coals. They don't get burned. But it's not just them who walk on hot coals. They do it in Thailand. They do it in India. They do it in J Japan. And this isn't even a religious event. This is kids walking with parents on hot coals. This is the world record holder. She's Canadian. Yay! She lives in Alberta. Anybody here from Alberta? <laughs> and her name's Amanda Dennison. She, walked, she has a world record of 220 feet walking on coals that are 16 to 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. That stuff melts steel. That degree melts steel. So what do these people know that we don't know? How conscious and how awake are they? It's obviously hot to these guys anyway. And they're walking on stuff that we don't even know we don't know. Here's a few more things. Can you shove metal skewers through your lips? Some people will say, why would I even think like that? <laughs> I don't know, I'm just putting it out there. <laughs> this guy, he broke a world record. Because the prevailing belief system at the time that he ran this race, the prevailing belief system by the world said it's impossible for a human being to run a mile quicker than four minutes. He didn't believe it. And he went and he got a coach and the coach taught him how to breathe. And when he ran this race, he ran it in three minutes, 58 seconds. Look at the faces on these people. Suddenly, he raised the bar. He shifted consciousness. So then people in the world went, oh, it's possible. And so what happens now? You run an Olympic race. What do those guys run them in? Three what? They get faster, I know. What's the world record for the Olympics now? Three what? You guys awake? <laughs> Three what? 40. 340. They run fast. So they're getting faster. They're shaving off more time. So he showed the world what's possible. So is it you that's going to go first? Is it you that's going to change your belief system and start saying that live in a world of infinite potential and possibilities? Or are you going to roll over and die? That's a choice. It's not good, bad, right, or wrong. It's your choice. So these guys make a choice to do amazing things because they know that the body is flexible, shiftable, changeable. They can do all kinds of things. And these guys were made famous, right, in a movie called Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. And people thought that was Hollywood special effects. They didn't know that there were real monks that did this. <laughs> Some people levitate. And it's not just Indian gurus, masters. It's Franciscan monks. <laughs> this is a Catholic order of monks. There was no camera, sorry, in 1668, so they did depictions. They wrote down what they witnessed. So he flies in church, but he also flew around the country. They levitate in China. This is the last photograph that Nerus allowed to be taken of him. He wrote the book, The Art of Levitation. Look who he's mentoring. Sony. 
who makes your cell phones and your computers and all that stuff you guys carry around? Sony. So somebody's listening out there because they're listening to spiritual mentors and, they, and they're dealing with stuff you can't see, so that's why you got Wi-Fi. So we have to learn to wake up. We have to awaken ourselves to a world of infinite potential and possibilities because we're living pretty small right now and we're pretty angry. There are six billion people on this planet and everybody wants change. Turn on your evening news, you're gonna see Egyptians, Libyans, everybody's mad. And we're not separate from the earth, so guess what all that angry resonance and vibration does to the planet? It starts to shake the planet. And it's getting more powerful and more forceful, and so you're gonna see more tornadoes and more things getting powerful and forceful. Because we're mad, we're pissed off. So when you ask the Dalai Lama, Dalai Lama, what can we do with all the earth changes and the earth transformations and stuff? Dalai Lama says, be happy. Yes, yeah, the guru in Toronto through the Art of Living Foundation. Guru, Ravi Shankar, what do we do? He says, be peaceful. But people say, hell, that ain't going to do any good. I'm going to have to go out there and just force the change because people don't listen. People don't treat each other well. People forgot what it's like to be kind and to live that way. So these guys, thank God these guys exist because they show us what's possible. And it's not just Shaolin monks in China who, who, who do all this stuff. Tibetan monks, flying llamas. I talk about flying llamas. Some of my students say, llamas don't fly because they're thinking about these llamas. These llamas fly in Air Force One. <laughs> or maybe you're thinking about these llamas. <laughs> but I'm telling you, I don't care whatever you're believing. You better know what the heck you're believing because I tell you, I believe in these. And when these guys start showing up, right? And I believe in my people's culture and I believe in this peace, this wampum belt of peace. And so I have to practice these things and remember that I come from a highly spiritually evolved people. And that the story of peace and transformation is just as applicable today as it was a thousand years ago. It's transformation and renewal. And this man tried to teach in his way. He died in 2010. Nobody listened to him because nobody understood him. And he was trying his best to try and tell people be peaceful. So who else is telling you to be peaceful? <coughs> Jesus tried to tell you. Muhammad tried to tell you. Krishna tried to tell you. Buddha tried to tell you. And 14 other world religions that I have no idea what those teachers did. But I do know that when I did the research for this, they haven't a clue what Native Americans believe in. They just know that they, we almost got killed off. Somehow we survived. We didn't get killed off with colonization. But you know what? We don't, you don't know what we believe in because we don't talk about it. <laughs> we don't tell you. But we know certain things. So Eckhart Tolle, the New Age spiritual teacher, was made famous by Oprah Winfrey. So his book, The Power of Now and the New Earth and all that stuff, he talks about the power of the intellect. This is my spiritual teacher. I get this guy. When I went to this, see this movie, I got him. Right off the bat, I understood. I got that I'm one with the force. I got this guy, too. As did everybody else, indigenous in the world, they got him. They understood what he was saying. So you can connect to yourself. I would say you got a spirit force in you. That's the force in you. It's in you. I would connect to that, and I'd pay attention. That means you've got to get out of that intellect, drop in that body, start waking up, paying attention. <coughs> That's yourself. Because belief, your beliefs are going to create your reality. Nobody's doing anything to you. You're doing it all to yourself. We are human beings. All perception is projection. I would con suggest you consider limiting, shedding your limiting beliefs, because if you think you're small, you're going to live a small life. I am not small. 
And I choose to live in a world of endless possibility, so I manifest, I create my reality. I don't put up with it, I create it. That's the kind of powerful human being you all are. But if nobody taught you this and nobody told you that, you might think something else. So realize that it's no longer about repairing the damage, it's about creating a different future for ourselves. And we need to really consider who do you believe you are? And what can you do and what are you capable of achieving? So as the earth keeps on, the, the winter, where those and people say, where did winter go? We didn't have winter this year. You might not get a summer when the, everything's shifting and changing. Anything is possible. And you have to be up for that, or you're going to roll over and get scared and say, I'm scared I'm going to die. Because if you believe you're going to die, you will. So I want to give thanks to you and leave you with these two quotes. You cannot solve the problems of the world by using the same level of thinking that created them. And Einstein said that many, many moons ago. And the only thing that you have is right now, in the moment, in the presence. That's all there ever is, the present moment. And when you're there, it's still, it's sacred, and it's peaceful. Get out of the head and start dropping down into that body. Take a meditation course. Try to figure out how to connect to who you really are. So thank you very much for this presentation. This is where I come from. I live at the Six Nations of the Grand River Territory, the program that I offer, three-day program in quantum healing. And there's where you'll find me. Thank you very much. Series. Thanks so much for coming and thanks to Diane Hill for trying to awaken our consciousness. Woo!